flow through the dam was to clear away the water that was in the river. And they did that by blasting dynamite into the sides of the canyon walls to create four diversion tunnels, one of which we are standing in right now. Each of these tunnels are 50 feet in diameter, but they actually blew them out to 56 feet and then lined three feet of concrete all the way around. The tunnels are approximately three quarters of a mile in length on each side. So it took almost two years to do that first part of the project without blasting, digging, excavating out the dirt and rock. And then, um, uh, to get the water actually to go into the uh, uh, tunnels, they took a lot of that excavated dirt and rock, and they used it to create two smaller dams called coffer dams, one on the top and one at the lower end. The upper coffer dam diverted the river water to go into the tunnels so that it would come out the lower end. The lower coffer dam just prevented any water from backing up into the construction site, which was about a half mile in length. So with those two smaller dams in place, they still had to continue digging away and scraping away all the extra uh, mud and water, loose dirt, rock, loose debris, until they hit a hard, solid bedrock foundation for the base of the dam. Then they brought even more construction crews in, and we're talking 1930s Depression era. These guys worked diligently around the clock with only two days off a year. They were lowering huge buckets filled with eight cubic yards of concrete, which about as much as much it fills up an entire cement truck like you see on the roads, lowering them down by cable way from the canyon walls down into wooden box platforms in order to build up the dam. At the height of construction, they timed it to where those big buckets were coming down every 78 seconds, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop. I know I'm not even sure how they did it with only two days off a year, but they did and came in a little bit ahead of schedule. So the structure of the dam was completed just shy of two years. But before it was done, they closed off three of those tunnels with huge steel gates and concrete tunnel plugs. And that allowed water to start filling up behind the dam to create great need, while one tunnel was left open just to keep water flowing down the Colorado River. Um, they put intake towers higher up on the rock ledges on the sides. So once that water level hit the bottom of those towers, then they were able to close off that last tunnel like they did the first three. And um, they uh, closed off that tunnel uh, at another uh, tunnel plug, and then the, that gave the, the sorry that gave the water some place to funnel through down through the uh, power plant and down the river. We're going to go over the power plant in just a couple of seconds, so you can uh, uh, check out the, uh, the generators that we have over there. But before we do, I'm just going to show you our two uh, spillways. There's one on the Nevada side and one on the Arizona side. Sorry, I got somebody talking in my ear. Um, so the spillways are very important for any dam because in order uh, to prevent error flood water from ever flooding over the top of the dam. Um, the um, spillways sit 27 feet lower than the top of the dam, and there's gates on the sides of those which also can control any flood water, which most might ever arise. So um, if, if that ever happens, water goes down to the spillways, and then it drains out to other tunnels that were built over those tunnel floods and makes its way down the diversion tunnel down the river, so we never have to worry about flood situations. Now, the only time the spill rates have been used, there's only two times in history of the Hoover Dam that the spillways were used. The first time was for testing in 1941 when the lake was first built. And the second time was a flood emergency we had in 1983. A lot of rain and snow up in the mountains that year. And the snow melt coming down from the Rocky Mountains and the upper basin states was so heavy along with more rains that summer uh, that the level of Lake Mead rose to just seven feet below the top of the dam, as you can see in this picture on the right. So this is the, that little wall back there is actually the top of our dam, the intake towers, and then water gushing down from the spillways. As a local, it was really big news to see at the time because the water um, pressure going over was so hard and it ran continuously for 63 days as those flood waters came down. But I, and, uh, and to see it was a sight because of the, the water coming out of the base of the tunnels and like I said, the spray and the spillways coming back up. I told people it was actually better than any water show that you see the Palacio. Um, <laughs> and uh, just because somebody could have the nerve to ask me this was, I saw it in 1983, not 1941. Yeah. Not that old. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna lead you guys back to the elevators now. We're gonna head over to the power plant. We are gonna use two elevators again, but if you get on a different one from the one you came on, don't panic, because we're all gonna go to the same spot. But do stay with your immediate family. The intake towers, it travels down into these pipes, um, and uh, the pressure then, it diverts off into smaller pipes that go beneath our power plant floor, so that increases the pressure, and that's what hits those uh, generators at the power plant that come through. So yeah, so this, this comes from the intake towers, travels through, and you feel that vibration underneath your feet. That's actually water that is traveling beneath us right now. And at times that water will go up to um, 96,000 gallons a second, which is enough to fill an Olympic sized swimming pool, less than seven seconds. There, they come to the side and then those will actually go over to the generators. Are 70 feet in height, but all the top 
shaft, which ultimately propels a gigantic load with a spin at 180 revolutions per minute. And currently, you guys are in for a little treat because one of those giant rotors just happens to be out for maintenance directly below the balcony. That's not normally out there on our tours. You guys get to see something that other tours don't. They're going to be doing some maintenance on this and replacing it down in that third generator sometime soon. And that's why it looks like right now there's a gap in between the first two and the last five generators because they're doing maintenance on that third generator right now. So, one generator creates 130 megawatts of electricity for approximately 65,000 homes. A light at the top shows us when they're in operation and they can get electricity that we all love to use. One generator makes 130 megawatts. Well, when they're all in um, operation in both wings, they have the capability of creating up to 2,080 megawatts of electricity to supply power for over a million homes in parts of Southern California, Southern Nevada, and Arizona. Now, as you look above the generators now towards the ceiling, you can also see our green P and H bridge cranes. We have two cranes here and two more in the Arizona wing. The closer train here has the American flag hanging on it, and the second one is the further behind it down the other end of the bay. They are attached to metal rails on the sidewalls, and that allows them to travel up and down the entire length of the room whenever lifting is needed to the heavy objects and equipment on the power plant floor. One crane can lift up to 300 tons. But when we bring them both together, it creates like a super crane that can lift up to 600 tons. And that lifting capacity is needed because the giant rotor down there, uh, by the time they end up working on it, they're going to do a lot of heavy electromagnets and poles and coils and things on those edges. It's going to end up weighing, weighing 580 tons. So it's going to take both the cranes to come down here and lift it up and replace it back in the third generator. 580 tons. That is more than twice the weight of the Statue of Liberty in New York. Over here, and I'm a lover of art. If you look at the flooring that you're standing on, you'll see this is Terrazzo Marble Flooring. It was flooring custom finished in 1937 by a Italian engineer family, the Martina family. They, uh, the cost of this flooring project, the Terrazzo Marble, was about $59,000 back in that day. Today's market will be millions and millions of dollars to do this type of art and work. And the Art Deco design, so it's a large circle going back here, a small diamond shaped one on the side. These were designed by the artist Alan and there's about 100 more threat in areas that down. This large circular inlay is often box of the water room and around a turbine that we have our generators. Uh, somebody else can look at it more as a piece uh, of electrical surface around the solar energy. But are these subject to interpretation? So you might see something else. Now we've been down to our early channels. We're over here in the power plant now with the generators. We're still not inside the down, although we are next to it. So if you've actually
Congress in 1947. So why did they choose this cannon over that one? A couple of reasons. One of those was the height of the canyon walls here. As it turns out, they could build a really tall dam in this canyon. In fact, when Hoover Dam was finished in 1935, it was the tallest dam in the whole world at 726 feet tall. Another reason why they chose this canyon was the hardness of the rock here. So what's surrounding us here today is an igneous volcanic rock called Andesite Pachia. It's harder than granite, and they needed that for a very special reason, because the dam is actually wedged in the canyon. So what they did is they notched out the canyon about 75 feet on each side. They poured the dam into those notches. So what's holding this dam in place are two things. It's weight, as well as lake feet behind us, pushing it into these canyon walls. So these walls kind of support the dam. Now, we're going to head inside the dam, but here's the deal, folks. Uh, we're going to go to the end of this tunnel. That elevator only holds 20, but we have over 30. today is something I have at home, and I'll bet you do too, 
natural gas. That's what produces the most power. Second on the list, coal burning plants. We still have those. Third on the list, producing the most power, uh, high, um, nuclear power. And we're fourth, and then of course coming in big in the future would be probably wind and solar, right? So it all goes into that grab bag of how we charge our cell phones and our new Teslas, right? So, anybody have any questions? We're still waiting for the elevator. Should be here in a couple of minutes. How much longer can you all produce? I mean, what's, what's the prediction on the, this? Well, the predictions don't look good. Okay, let's go back to the uh, level of the lake. Now, if you have not seen Lake Beat uh, up till now, you will at the end of the uh, tour. You'll be up there on the top of the dam. Uh, Lake Mead is at the lowest level it's ever been in 87 years. It's only 27% full. So as you look at Lake Mead out there, it, uh, there, you'll notice a white band around the lake. Well, that is about 160 feet of white. And that white is made up of a mineral in the water called calcium carbonate. So there's a lot of minerals in the Colorado River. And so it leaves that residue as the water has gone up and down over the years. So you're looking at 160 feet of white. That represents full pool. The last time the lake was at full pool was the year 2000. So the uh, lake has actually been going down for the last 22 years. So 27% full, lowest level it's ever been in 87 years. So the future, as I understand it, doesn't look very good. It looks like it's going to continue to go down. So the question you ask is how long before we can produce power? On the intake towers, there are two openings. We are about 100, 100 feet away from that first opening. And as, it, as the lake goes down, the amount of power that we can put out goes down. So even though we can do 2,000 megawatts, we're only doing about 1,000 right now because of the lack of water. And as that water goes down, the efficiency goes down and the output goes down. So we're 100 feet away from that. If it goes past that, we can't produce any power. But the real dire situation is the one that's 55 feet beneath the first one. If it goes past that one, guess what? We can't keep the Colorado River flowing. And 30 million people here in the Southwest rely on Colorado River water. So it's a huge economic impact of both, obviously, the water supply. Most of this water, the majority of it, is going for agriculture in Southern California. So we all benefit from that. A third of the fruits and vegetables in this country that we all consume are uh, consumed by Colorado River water, and mostly in the Imperial Valley of Southern California. So once again, uh, very, very huge economic impact. So I don't know what the answers are. Um, if you have any suggestions, we have a suggestion box upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, yes, sir. Oh, right here. Anybody have any questions? All the uh, salt and sediment that was excavated in order to get the bad rock below, where did all that go? Okay. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the rock that they scraped out 135 feet of it. What we have around here is a lot of open space. So they just dumped it. I think we look down where you can see some of those tailings down there. So it's probably they just dumped it out there. Yeah. Question, sir. Uh, are there, there are bypass or boats or locks in them or anything like that? Or no, there's no, there, there's no through traffic on, on the Colorado. So in other words, boats can't go from one side to the other, no lock system. And even, even the fish don't go from one side to the other because there are no, um, Migratory fish on the Colorado, you know, unlike say Columbia River, where the salmon need to migrate and often down to Colorado. We don't have that here in Colorado. So Lake Mead is a uh, uh, national recreation area, so it is managed by the, uh, the Park Service and uh, Fish and Wildlife. There's a uh, fish hatchery on the lake, so they stock it with game fish, and the fishing is supposed to be pretty great out there. Uh, bass as big as Volkswagens, they tell me. <laughs> yes, sir. Are the finishings that we're walking through in these tunnels, are these original? Was it always this yes. nicely finished? Yeah, that's why this tunnel looks so fancy. This was the route of the tours for uh, 60 years. Uh, terrazzo tile, or, uh, the subway tiles, the terrazzo floors, all the fixtures are done in aluminum. This is that Art Deco look that uh, the whole dam was built in, popular during the 20s and 30s, and it's getting to some point of a resurgence today. Uh, and the reason why the chain is here is to keep the groups that were leaving and the groups coming off that elevator separated, okay? So everything is uh, almost original from uh, the way it was uh, 85 years ago. Anything else? Yes, sir. Has the uh, dam ever shut 
shut down due to an earthquake? Well, I'll tell you, they built the dam to withstand an 8.6 earthquake. So even though uh, we do have, we're seismically active here in Nevada, Nevada is the third most seismically active state after California and Alaska, believe it or not, uh, in terms of numbers. But it's never shut down the dam. The largest recorded earthquake here at the dam was 5.2 back in the uh, 19. Uh, 50s, no damage on the dam whatsoever. But I, I, I'm not sure, I don't believe the dam has ever sh shut down because of the earthquakes. What is that number up there say out of all the uh, uh, That's not four. It's on four. So they should be coming down to get us right now. I would hope folks, okay. Yeah. How far did you say down we were in the dam? How far did you? We are uh, about 500 feet from where you started. Yes, there were several times in the history where we have not uh, done tours. World War II, they were shut down for the four years of World War II. Um, and then after 9-11, they shut us down completely. They didn't want to do tours anymore. Uh, but then they rethought that and decided to continue doing tours, but only once they got security in place. So that's why you had to go through the security check up there and then, uh, you know, the, uh, the bag check. Everywhere you go on tour today, you're on camera. So make sure you always smile. Okay. Here we go. Okay. upper left one as you look at it 75 feet down one beneath us and there are two corresponding air vents on the uh, Arizona side so why in fact do we have these air vents uh, in the dam not for looks they're here for a specific reason <clears throat> they're here to bring the air into the center of this six million tons of concrete to help with the curing or the hardening of the concrete which is extremely long term now the way curing was just uh, explained to me it's kind of a bell-shaped configuration so even though hoover dam is 87 years old we're at the bottom of that bell in terms of the hardness of this concrete over the years it's going to work its way up to the hardest and then over the centuries this thing is going to weaken if not invented by the ancient romans concrete was certainly perfected by them and some of that roman concrete i understand is still curing so talk about long term right so why in fact do we have these service tunnels here in the dam well another good reason uh, they are servicing obviously our elevators and a few other things up here but in addition they needed access to the middle of this concrete to find out how it's doing they don't want it, they want it to be a guessing game so what they'll do occasionally is they'll uh, they'll do what's called core sampling so they'll walk through these tunnels and find a spot and drill down and bring up a core or a cylinder of concrete they do compression tests on that they do chemical tests on it and they fill in that hole but keep that core in our, our labs for comparisons over the years and they found out that after 80 plus years the concrete in the middle of this dam is still wet which kind of gives you an idea of the massiveness of this structure so how, how in the world did they achieve that well first of all this is not your ordinary driveway you're standing on here they overbuilt Hoover Dam by 70%. They built this dam to withstand an 8.6 earthquake, as I mentioned earlier. And believe it or not, it has a 2,000 year life expectancy. I look at it as job security. <laughs> okay, I got it circled on my calendar. Okay, so let's say we have, uh, we got to leave in about uh, 10 minutes or so. If we have an earthquake in the next 10 minutes, how are we going to get out of here? Well, I always have somebody say, let's go out that air vent. <laughs> Well, that is not my first choice, folks. My first choice to get out of here, if we have an earthquake, because we can't get on the elevator, is go up the staircase. They thought to put stairs in the dam, very old school. So you're, that's our next stop to look at that impressive staircase, which is not like the staircase you have at home. 
This staircase follows the angle of the dam, about a 55% grade. Also, it curves. Why does that start staircase curve? Because of the shape of the dam. So to get from the top to the bottom, that staircase has to follow the inside curve of the dam. So what you'll be looking at is 717 stair steps. So keep those uh, fingers crossed that you don't have to walk out today. So, any questions while we're standing here? You're talking about the curing of the concrete during construction. Well, that was the cooling. That was a little different I mean, process. Cooling. Right. Yeah, the, when they put in, they okay. do that. Right. We did, did this tour about 35 years ago, and I don't think we did the air vents, but they right. talked about the, the cooling right. of the concrete. They, they put one inch steel pipes, they laced those through each one of the concrete blocks. Uh, and then they ran ice water from the uh, river through those and cooled that block down in three days, 72 hours. So that allowed this to be a continuous pour here from start to finish. Um, and by the way, they left those pipes in the dam. They're surrounding us right now. About 600 miles of those pipes are still surrounding us. Not serving any purpose. They aren't rebar. There is no rebar in the dam, by the way. Uh, but they did fill them in with uh, concrete just to, you know, to stabilize them. But uh, they left them in place. So, any other questions? Let's go ahead and head to the... It's just so big, you know, the bottom of the Let me call your attention to the box down here. Uh, this is an earthquake sensor. We have a number of these in the dam on the property, and these are all monitored in our control room. And as I mentioned earlier, the dam was built to withstand an 8.6 earthquake, and as you know, there's an earthquake scale. It's called the Richter scale. It's a 10-point scale. So 8.6 is right up there at the top. Quite a healthy jolt this thing can receive with no damage. But uh, once again, the largest recorded earthquake was nowhere near that. It was 5.6 back in the 50s, no damage. Uh, so I would guess if we have an earthquake in the next, we gotta leave here in about two or three minutes. In the next three minutes, if we have an earthquake, what happened? You know, uh, you're probably in the safest spot on earth when it comes to earthquakes. It doesn't get any safer than 8.6. So you can breathe easy on the earthquake thing, folks. Well, for three minutes. <laughs> so any final thoughts or questions you might have, folks? Anything I can do? Uh, the dam moved? Has the dam moved in this space? Uh, not really. Okay, it can move. I mentioned down there that they notched out the canyon and they poured it in there, but they didn't attach it. So the dam actually can move by millimeters. If the lake is full or empty, the dam can either push into those notches or back off a little bit. But we're talking millimeters here, not you know anything you have to hold on. You know. <laughs> I heard the Chinese one did move. It had to be flooding a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, you mean the Three Gorges? Yeah. Three Gorges. Yeah. Yeah. Have you guys been there? Yeah, I've been there. Okay. I did a lot of research. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny about that. Uh, for years, as they were planning that and building that. Uh, they, the Chinese engineers were here at Hoover Dam with clipboard in hand, so to speak, taking notes on what we did right here. And then they went back and hopefully applied that, but apparently not very well uh, if they're having a lot of trouble there. Uh, but um, that, that this was sort of the, uh, you know, the, the schematic for them, I guess. And so, it, yes, so when you talk about the control room, like the earthquake sensor going there, how big is the control room and how much stuff are they monitoring? Well, uh, I, I don't have any access to that. that I can go just about any place I want to here in the, on the property except the control room. I don't even know where it is. That's kind of the brains of the outfit here, so it is super secret. Uh, uh, that is where they monitor the amount of water going down the river, which generators are on and off. You know, um, they monitor, you know, the, any seismic activity. Uh, they take uh, requests for additional water down there. All that is done here. So uh, that would all be mm -hmm. control. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, folks, I believe we are getting toward the end here, so let me lead you back and we'll get you on your way, okay? Yeah, the third star. Yeah, the third star. That goes into Las Vegas, yeah. I need to put this chain on so if I can have this stuff out there. Oh, I gotta go out here. Okay, yep. See you later. Thanks. Bye bye. Something broke. <laughs> 